go ahead and go to John chapter 21. And so, this is it. The final chapter, and uh, uh, so many great things in here. Just a clear theme throughout this book that it's, it's written so we will believe. And we see that at the end of chapter 20 that we looked at last week. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The book of John is something that we want to, uh, that is written trying to get people saved. That's what it was all about. So people would read it, they would believe, and they would get saved. There's some books in the Bible, they're just kind of historical, they're just kind of telling us the facts. This is what happened. But this book, it was written with clear motivation. It's, he's, John is wanting people to get saved. And his theme throughout there is just believe him, believe him, believe him. He's the water of life. He's the bread of life. You know, he is the resurrection of life. He's all of these things that we talk about. Jesus Christ is all those things. And he really just emphasizes this idea of believing. Because if we'll believe on him, we will get saved. And notice the book of John, it doesn't talk a whole lot about works. It doesn't talk about a whole lot about, you know, repenting of your sins and turning from your sins and all those things that people are trying to say you have to do in order to be saved. He just, I mean, just hammers away on this believing on Christ because that is how you get saved. And so I, I think we can trust John. Of course, this is the word of God. But, you know, he, he, he humanly speaking, he is, uh, I mean, one of the closest disciples to Jesus, the beloved disciple. And we're going to look at some things about that as we go through this chapter. But let's go ahead and start reading in verse one. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. The Sea of Tiberias is the Sea of Galilee. It's another name for it. And there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore. Now they were not able to draw up for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish there, uh, laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land, full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken." Jesus saith to them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples, after that he was risen from the dead. So we're going to stop reading right there. So we see here, this is the third appearance. You had the first appearance in that uh, upper room. Jesus showed up while the doors were closed. He stood in the midst of them. They saw him, they handled him. And then uh, the next week, because Thomas, remember Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't going to believe till he saw Jesus. And then Thomas, uh, he ends up seeing Jesus too. And now we have, I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us how many days have passed, but Jesus has not been around his disciples. That whole 40 days, it's, it's kind of strange because you know Jesus walked the earth for 40 days, yet there were long periods of time where he wasn't with his disciples. So what was he doing? Okay, I have no idea. Okay, I, I really don't have any idea and I don't think we'll know until we get to heaven. But uh, for whatever reason, there were some long periods of time where Jesus was not with his disciples. But this Bible says it was the third appearance. And you know, it's interesting because in all the other gospels, it basically goes from the resurrection to Jesus appearing to the disciples, like we saw in last week in John chapter 20. And then it goes right to the ascension almost every time. You don't read this story about him going to you know, the Sea of Tiberias, uh, which was 
quite a ways from Jerusalem. It was it was a long way. You don't you don't read about that in any of the other gospels. If it weren't for the Gospel of John, we would probably just assume they hung around Jerusalem that whole forty days. You would probably assume Jesus was with them during most of that time, but that that clearly wasn't the case. And so, you know, from the book of John, we see there was long periods of time, you know, between the appearances of Jesus, which I think, you know, probably caused some frustration amongst the disciples. Because first of all, you know, we see how, um, you know, even after the resurrection, the disciples were, they remember how they weren't real excited, were they? They're hiding they're still hiding. They're still in fear. You'd think they wouldn't be scared of anything after Jesus had been resurrected. But sure enough, they were. Jesus had to come. He stood in the midst of them. He said, Pete, you know, he's telling them, peace be unto you. But then another, like another week passes. Jesus isn't with them. Then he shows up again. You know, and they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know, you know he's going to send 40 days later. They don't know what's coming up. So they're, I think they're probably getting kind of frustrated. You know? And so finally, what I believe happens here. Because you know, it's like they're kind of in limbo. Hey, what what's going on? You know, why? Okay, yes, Jesus rose from the dead, but you know, we're seeing him like once a week. You know, these long periods of time. What are we supposed to do? It's dangerous at Jerusalem right now. They're probably going to try to kill us. You know what? And so Peter says, "I'm going fishing." You know, I think he's got, a lot of people believe this that he was kind of going back to his old occupation. What he used to do. Because, you know, we see here in these passages that the disciples, you know, they were still very confused. They hadn't changed yet. They hadn't been converted yet. We often use the term converted to show someone who, you know, to refer to someone who gets saved. But here we're going to see Peter or Jesus talking to Peter and he says, you know, when you're converted. So, you know, because once again, I think that proves salvation does not necessarily mean a changed life. Okay? And a changed life, it doesn't happen to everybody that gets saved. Some people, some people do, some people don't. So the disciples, I think they were very possibly going back to making a living the way they did before. And so in, uh, when Jesus appears, okay, notice how, notice how he does it. So they're all out there fishing. They're not catching anything. Okay? Now they were fishermen. They had bad fishing days before. But can anybody remember a bad fishing day they had one time back before they started following Jesus where they were fishing and they didn't catch anything and then all of a sudden Jesus tell, comes along and tells them to cast the net in again? Let's go back and look at that story because what I think happened here, at first they didn't notice that it was Jesus. And even after he tells them to cast it in on the other side and they do and they get this great multitude of fishes, You'll notice that Peter didn't notice that it was Jesus. It was John that noticed it was Jesus. And he points it out to Peter that it was Jesus. And so I think what was happening here, I think Jesus is kind of reminding him, hey guys, do you remember what I originally called you to do? Look, Go back to Luke chapter 5 and verse 1 because the story is very similar to the story that we read here in John. It says in uh, Luke chapter 5, in verse 1, and it came to pass that as the, the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And notice they've already cleaned their nets too. They're not wanting to get them all dirty again. But Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when he had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were with him at the drought of the fishes, uh, which was taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. From henceforth, from here on, you're going to catch men. Not just temporarily. I haven't called you to do this just for three years. From henceforth, from now until you're dead, 
you are going to catch men. That's your new occupation that I have called you to do. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. That was what God called them to do. God called them to be fishers of men. And what did Peter do? I'm going back to fishing for fish again. And Jesus shows up and he tells them, and I, I think you know, he tells them, hey, cast it on the other side. And when they did, John, who was present there in Luke chapter 5, he realizes that, hey, this is, this is Jesus. He said in verse 7, that, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John who wrote this, saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Okay, Peter's so clueless, all right? You know, it seems like you know, they would have, he would have figured it out right away. I mean, as soon as he told him, hey, cast it in on the other side. That's a weird request, isn't it? You know, they should have known. And at least as soon as they started catching the fish, Peter should have realized it was Jesus. But he didn't. And, the, and so the Bible says that, you know, when he did, it says, he, you know, he girded his fish's coat on him. You know, he put on him tightly because, you know, he, for he was naked and he cast himself into the sea. He got so excited that Jesus was there. He wasn't even going to wait for the boat to get to shore. He jumps in the water, swims to shore to get to Jesus. Is, is what I believe is going on. Then the other disciples, they come up in the boats. You know, they're dragging, they're dragging the fish along. And so they are, they're, they're excited because once again, they, you know, Peter, he's kind of been in limbo. I don't think, you know, except when he was, I, I do think he kind of was backsliding here, my personal opinion. You know, and like many backsliders, they don't do it on purpose, okay? Nobody just one day says, you know what? I'm going to backslide. I'm going to get away from God. I'm going to drift away. I'm going to go back to doing what I used to do. It's just something that happens when people get tired of waiting. Okay. Part of the Christian life is having patience. It's waiting on the Lord. And Peter, you know, we know he struggled. You know, he was somebody who was very passionate with sometimes it would get himself in trouble. And so he, but at the same time, I think he had a desire to serve Christ. And I believe he was excited when he saw Jesus. And so they do, they all, they all come to land and they're getting ready to eat some fish. And so it says in verse 15, so, um, when he had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he signifying of what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. I believe Jesus singled Peter out here for a few reasons. Okay. I think uh, first, the reason I think he reason he singled Peter out is Peter was a leader amongst the disciples. Was he not? You know, and wasn't it always a kind of a competition amongst the disciples who was the greatest. Okay. They were always having that conversation. Okay. And listen, even though we know Jesus never gave any of them the official title of the greatest disciple. Okay. Amongst the disciples, there was definitely, uh, they had their opinions, I think. And, you know, so, you know, you remember James and John's mother came to Jesus, grant that one sit in your right hand, one sit in the left. All the other disciples got mad. I want that spot. So you know, among you know, like uh, amongst Jesus' disciples, there was kind of a, a hierarchy that Jesus did not form. Okay, but but it was in their own opinions. But at the same time, okay, humanly speaking, which ones would we say were probably the top two or in running for the top spot? If there was a top spot, who would we think was in contention for it? Yeah, Peter. I think Peter and John. You know, because Peter, like I said, he was, he was kind of a leader because who was it that said, I go a fishing and then all the other ones like, yeah, we're going fishing too. You, you, can, you can see how they just kind of followed Peter, didn't they? And even after, uh, and when you go into the book of Acts, it was kind of Peter leading things at Pentecost, wasn't it? 
I mean, Peter was the one that kind of led. And, um, you know, and it was uh, Peter, you know, that Jesus said, you know, I've given you the keys of, what did he say exactly? I forgot how that went, but he talked about giving him the keys. They got a statue of him over there in Israel. I remember seeing that. If you go to, uh, I forgot the town Peter lived in, Caesarea Philippi, maybe they got this big Catholic statue of him there, and it's got him holding the keys of death and hell uh, <laughs> there. But, um, but anyway, you know, he definitely was a leader. And so I, I think he singled him out because of that, because these you know, other disciples are all kind of following Peter now. And Peter was kind of leading them back to the old occupation that they weren't supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be fishers of men. And so I think part, that could be part of the reason Jesus was singling him out. Um, also, I believe he was uh, singling him out because he hadn't changed his mind about his calling for his, on his life. Okay, look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 6. I want to point something out to you in this passage. Mark chapter 16 and verse 6. This is at right after the resurrection. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. This is the angel talking. And look at this. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him as he said unto you. Why did the angel say, go tell his disciples and Peter? Shouldn't, isn't Peter included in the disciples? Didn't that cover Peter when they said, go tell his disciples? Why did he single out, why did the angel specify Peter right there? Okay? I think probably for the same reason, Jesus is kind of singling out Peter right here because I think it's very possible that Peter probably thought he was out. Because Peter denied Jesus three times. Three times when he's at, hey, you're one of his disciples. He said, no, I'm not. And I think Peter thought, you know what? I blew it. I denied him three times. I no longer am a disciple of Christ. But you know what? We see in... Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind on those callings. When Jesus called Peter and he called him to be a fisher of men, when he called him to be one of his disciples, that was God's plan for Peter. And God didn't change his mind, even though Peter had changed his mind. You know, Peter, he f figured he was done for. He blew it. He denied Jesus three times. Peter thought he was done for. He said, you know what? I'm going back to my old job of fishing for fish. But Jesus comes along and he's like, no, I'm not done with you, Peter. And he keeps telling them, you know, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. What's he doing? He's telling them, I'm not done with you. I've got something for you. I, you are one of my disciples. And so he, did, he just kept asking them. And I think too, uh, obviously part of the reason he did it three times it's like he's kind of making up for the three times that he denied Jesus. And so, yeah, you, you think you're out because you denied me three times. But here, I'm asking you, three times. You know, lovest thou me more than these? And he is, he's calling because Jesus does not repent of his callings. He teaches that in Romans eleven twenty nine. So, uh, and I believe also, uh, well, look at verse 18. Uh, when he says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. In other words, when you were young, you did what you wanted to do. You went where you wanted to go. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. Okay, when you're old, someone is going to take you. You're going to stretch forth your hands and you're going to be carried where you would not. Okay, now... That's not super clear what that means from that right there, okay? But in verse 19, it says, This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. So we know that when Jesus said that to Peter, he was referring to the type of death he would die, okay? Now, what kind of death do you die where you're stretching out your arms? Well, we know crucifixion, right? And according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is not Bible, it's history, okay? You know, it, it's tradition that Peter died on a cross 
And they say he died upside down because he did not feel worthy to die like Jesus. And so, uh, you know, he, they requested that he uh, be crucified upside down. Okay, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But what Jesus said here, John flat out says he told him that signifying by what death he should glorify God. Okay, and you know what? If that's true, if what Fox's Book of Martyrs says is true about how Peter died, that was him glorifying God, wasn't he? He was martyred. Dying for the cause of Christ is, is, a, is a great honor. We glorify God in that. There's a great reward in heaven for that. But I believe that Jesus, though, he's telling him this here because you know, he's telling him, follow me, follow me. You know, when things got hard before, what did Peter do? You know, first, he followed Jesus afar off, and then he denied Jesus three times. But Jesus has not changed his mind about his calling for Peter. And so he's telling him this. He's, he's basically telling him, hey, Peter, I want you to keep following me, but guess what? It's not going to be easy. I want you to follow me, but you know what? It's going to lead to your death. You're going to die as a result of following me and doing my will. Jesus was making him well aware of the fact that following him would not be easy. And nowhere in the Bible do we see that following Jesus is going to be easy. Well, what about that verse in the Bible that says, Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, that's referring to salvation. Salvation is easy. Okay, but serving God is not always easy. Being a disciple is not always easy. And so uh, I think he's trying, he's trying to do that. He's just, you know, he's reminding him, hey, I've got this calling for you, but you know what? It's only going to get more difficult. And so uh, this, uh, but this passage, okay, you need, you need to mark this one in your Bible because this passage here completely refutes the idea that Peter thought the rapture could come in his day. I hear preachers say this all the time. Peter thought the rapture could come in his day. They use verses from Peter to prove imminency. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. I'm actually going to be talking about that next week at uh, a at, uh, post-trib conference. But let me go ahead and show you something. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. You say, well, you know, that, that, that's not real clear there in uh, you know, what we see there. But no, Jesus said... That he was, he was basically telling him what kind of death he was going to die. And Jesus specifically said it was going to happen when he was old. Okay? When you're old. So we know that, you know, the rapture can't come until Peter gets old because Jesus said you're going to get old. The rapture can't come until Peter has been martyred because Jesus prophesied that he was going to be martyred. And people, preachers say it all the time. I listened to one one time. He was do, he, they were a uh, guy was doing an interview with him. He's a big pre-trib pusher, big prophecy guru, and he's on there talking about how Peter believed the Lord could return in his day. And I'm, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Have you not read John chapter twenty one verses eighteen and nineteen? Have you not read Second Peter chapter one verse thirteen and fourteen? Look what it says. And it, um, oh, I'm in chapter two. Uh, it says, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Y'all see that? Peter right there is saying, Hey, I know I'm shortly going to put off this tabernacle. I am shortly going to die. Okay, how do you know that? Well, Peter was probably old when he wrote Second Peter. And he said, I'm going to put off this tabernacle just like Jesus showed me. So if Peter knew from that time there in John that he was going to die a martyr's death when he was old, why would he think the rapture was going to come in his day? Well, and you know where they get that from? It's because he talks about looking and hasting into the coming day of God, you know, uh, looking for you know the day of the Lord and all that. But the thing is, you know, just because you're looking for something, it doesn't mean it's imminent. And he, if you look at those th all the things that he talks about looking for and watching for, one of the things Peter mentions is that looking for the new heavens and the new earth. Well, when are the new heavens and new earth coming? That doesn't come till after the millennium. So how could, you know, if, if looking for something means it's imminent, means you think it can happen in your day, then... Peter thought 
the new, or the new heaven and new earth was imminent. Therefore, Peter was a post-millennialist. You know, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's a stupid argument. But preachers say it all the time and no one ever calls them out on it. No one ever brings that up. Hey, Jesus told Peter, you are going to die a martyr's death when you're old. And Peter mentioned it in 2 Peter that, hey, what was revealed to me by Jesus, it's going to be happening pretty soon. And so to say that Peter thought the rapture could come in his day is just foolish. And it, it's, I mean, proven, spelled out in the Bible that that can't be the case. And I get so tired of hearing people say that. And uh, if I ever hear anybody say it live, they're, they're probably going to get hit with a tomato because I'm just, I'm tired. Most of the time when I hear it, you know, it's online or after the fact, but people say it all the time. I don't know how, they, I know how they get away with it because Obviously, everyone listening doesn't have a clue about the Bible. If they would just read John 21 and 2 Peter chapter 1 and pay attention to what they're reading, they would know that that can't be true. Saying that Peter thought rapture could come in his day. I just completely disprove that, but people will continue to say it because they're stubborn and they're comfortable saying it because all the great preachers of the past have said that. And they're just repeating what these guys are saying. They're not preaching the Bible. They're repeating lines of sermons from people that they trusted. And so they're going to keep on saying it because they do. They trust the great men more than they trust the Bible. And it doesn't matter that the Bible is completely contrary to that. But anyway, I got a little on a rabbit trail right there. So back, back to uh, where we were supposed to be. But the, you know, the problem that Peter was facing is that he was not converted even though he was saved. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31 says, And the Lord said unto Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Y'all see that? I think you know Satan wanted Peter. You know what? Jesus wanted Peter too. And Jesus prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. And he's like, hey, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. I think he's kind of telling them there. I want you to lead the disciples. I do think that Peter uh, was the leader there. And he's telling them, when you're converted. Okay? So does converted mean saved? Was Peter not saved when Jesus said that to him? I believe Peter was saved. But he was not converted. He had not changed yet. And there are, there's a lot of people out there that are saved, but they've not been converted yet. And until they get converted, they're never going to accomplish anything for God. Until they get converted, their life is not going to get better. And there are, there's a lot of people who have gotten saved and they come to church, but they still haven't been converted. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're converted. Until you are living your life, walking in the Spirit, you know, acting like a Christian seven days a week, not just on Sunday, your life's not going to get any better. Just because you're saved doesn't mean automatic blessings across the board. You need to get converted. You need to change your life. You need to repent of your sins. You need to start doing the things that a Christian is supposed to do and be converted so God can use you. And so I do. Peter, he, he, was, he was struggling. We see the struggles he had throughout Christ's ministry. Okay? He was constantly, you know, he'd do something good, but then you know, he'd get bawled out by Christ for something else. You know? He was the one, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, you know? Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter. You know, and he, Peter's all excited, puffed up, and then two seconds later, Jesus is like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be killed. And Peter's like, you know, he, he begins to rebuke Jesus. And then Pete, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, this guy just can't win. He's all over the place. He was the one, you know, I mean, though all men forsake you, I won't forsake you. Peter, for the cock crow twice, you're going to deny me thrice. And sure enough, he did that. Peter struggled. Peter had a lot of problems. And even after the resurrection, Peter's still struggling. And as Jesus has asked him these three times, lovest thou me more than these? I mean, it's grieving him. It's bothering him. You know, you know. And, but you know, Jesus is trying to get something across to him. Jesus is trying to teach him some things. And I personally believe, don't believe that Peter really got converted until Pentecost when he got filled with the Holy Ghost. And then all of a sudden, we kind of see a new Peter, don't we? And we see, and God ended up doing great things through Peter after he got converted. And if you want God to do great things for you, through you, you need to get converted. 
You need to start walking in the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. you got to stop walking in the flesh, because otherwise you're going to keep fulfilling the desires of the flesh. So, um, look at what it says in verse 21. So, Jesus, He's kind of giving Peter a chance, all right? Three times. Love us on me more than these. It's like He's making up. And Peter was probably clueless about it. Peter's clueless. He said He took him a long time to even recognize that it was Jesus, even after they caught all those fish. John had to point it out. Jesus, three times he's asked him this question. Jesus has you know, told him it's not going to be easy. He tells him you're going to die. Now listen, if I found out, if Jesus revealed to me that I was going to die, and I was going to die a martyr's death, I'm going to be you know, slightly concerned. All right, I might be very concerned by that. Okay, I mean, I, you know, I would have been like, can you give me a little more specifics on the age? Uh, you know, can, can, you, can you give me a location so I can make sure I don't go there? You know, I, I'd have probably been asking more questions along those lines. But look what happened. What is Peter's first question after he finds out he's going to die a martyr's death? Look what he says in verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, what? Uh, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? The first question he asks, what about John? It's like Peter's kind of still in competition here, isn't he? Peter's still worried, hey, is John going to take my spot? You know, even though, so John is the beloved disciple, he was the one that was closest to Jesus, but I think it's very clear it was Peter that Jesus wanted to kind of lead the disciples. I don't know, maybe Peter's still kind of jealous too because it was John that Jesus kind of commissioned to take care of his mother. He's like, you know, why, why didn't he ask me to do that? You know, why, why did he ask John? And so what is he, you know, he gets all, he gets all worried about John. Something's wrong with that. Verse 23, um, or yet, uh, then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So because of what Jesus said, you know, there's that rumor that went out that John wasn't going to die until Jesus returned. But John's saying that's not what he said. He was trying to just tell Peter, mind your own business. Okay, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Don't worry about John. Peter, you need to start worrying about yourself. You know what the problem is with a lot of Christians today? Is they're always worried about everybody else. You know, it's like a lot of, you know, a lot of Christians, well, yeah, yeah, I want to be a soul winner. You know, I want to, you know, I want to do great things for God. And then they'll go to church and they'll go to soul winning time. Oh, there's not very many people here. And, and then they quit. Well, listen, stop worrying about everybody else. Why don't you just do what you're supposed to do? You know, I need to go to church. Uh, you know, I, I want to go to church on Wednesday nights, but uh, there's not as many people here. Listen, if you believe you're supposed to be in church on Wednesday night, come, even if you're all by yourself. Why do you base what you're going to do on what other people do? And people do that all the time. They, they, they'll go and they, or they won't do something they're supposed to do because no one else is doing that. How about you just do what you know you're supposed to do? I preached a message a while back. You know, mind your own business and follow Jesus. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. When the offering plate comes by, don't be looking to see if anybody else is going to put anything in before you put something in. You just put something in whether anybody else does it or not. Stop checking to see what everybody else is going to do. You know, I hated that. When I was in school, when I was a teenager, or, or even when I was a youth director, I remember, you know, we'd plan these activities and things, and I would, a lot of times, you know, I would need to know who was going to come. All right? you know, I need a head count. I need to know who's going to come. And you always had a good portion of the teens, you know, and, and it's not all their fault. Teens are so brain dead, it's not even funny. But, you know, you got a lot of teenagers that just, you know, they can't think for themselves. And, you know, and it's like, all right, you know, I'd ask, all right, how many is going to be coming to this activity? And, you know, it's a pretty simple question. You know, a lot of times I've been announcing this for weeks, but it's like you've got all these teenagers that are sitting like, to see who else raise their, raises their hands. Because whether they do it or not, it depends on who else does it. And if other people, if this teenager's not going to do it, they're not going to do it either. Because they're just the followers. They're just the mindless drones. You know? and, and they would do that. It's like, no, I'm asking you. Why are you looking at your friend? You know, are you coming? Uh, you know, and th just can you make a decision on your own? Can you just do the right thing 
yourself and stop worrying about everybody else. Peter, he needed to start concentrating on himself. He needed to just do the right thing. Jesus told him, hey, I've told you, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. I told you a long time ago from henceforth, thou shalt catch men. I've given you a calling. I've given you something to do. I've been honest with you. I told you it's not going to be easy, but I told you you need to do it. Mind your own business and just follow me. Don't worry about John. Don't worry about anybody else. And we've got to have that mentality that I'm just going to do what what I'm supposed to do. We're not going to check and see what all the other churches are going to do. You know, we're not going to check the wind and see which way the wind's blowing on things. We're going to just preach the truth no matter what, no matter who's doing it, who's not doing it. And if you are, if you're one of these people, you know, you can't make any decision without calling people up. Hey, uh, are, are you going soul winning this weekend? Listen, you ought to just do it because it's what you're supposed to do. You don't need to check to see who all's doing it. And that, you know, t- I said it's one thing for teenagers to do that, but when adults start doing that, we got a problem. Just do the right thing. And so, you know, we, we should never even think about, you know, how is God going to use me in comparison to how he's going to use someone else? That is a foolish thing. Just be thankful you're being used and do what he wants. Because it's like Peter thought, this stinks. I'm going to die. All right. That's my, that's my end. That's what I'm going to get. What's John going to get? You know, Peter would have felt a lot better if Jesus said, well, he's going to die too. Yeah, he's going to die before you, which isn't what happened. But, you know, I think Peter would have felt better if Jesus would have told him that. You know, that shouldn't matter. And a lot of, you know, we ought to just do what God calls us to do. You know, what, you know, God might want some, you know, some of us to go to, you know, if, if, if you know, when God, you know, I always wanted God to call me down south. I wanted to go somewhere that was warm. You know, I want to go down south where people are friendly. At least to your face. You know, they, they say down south that they stab you in the back when you're not looking. Well, it's better than getting stabbed in the front up here in the north like they do. <laughs> you know? And so you know, I always wanted that. But, you know, at the same time, I was like, I want to do what God wants me to do. And a lot of people, it's like they're, they're always comparing their ministry, what they're at, what they're doing to other people. And, you know, we shouldn't even think about that. Well, man, how come they got the you know, start the church in Hawaii. You know, that's, hey, just do what God called you to do. You know, how come, you know, God called them to be a pastor and I'm just an assistant pastor. Hey, don't worry about that. Just do what God has called you to do. The best thing that you can do is what God has called you to do. You will accomplish more in God's will as just a, a layman and a soul winner in the church than you would being a pastor and not in God's will. You've got to just figure out what does God want me to do and then do it. And you will accomplish the greatest things that you ever will. And many people, they're not content with that. You know, they want this position. They're always looking at other people. You know, why didn't God put me there? Why didn't God give me this? Why didn't God give me that? You know, and that's a terrible attitude. You got to get past that. And I think that was part of Peter's problem. So look at what it says in verse 24. It says, then that, uh, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. He's talking about himself here. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that should be written Amen. So John and the other disciples think about, you know, they walked with Jesus for three years. Three years they walked with Jesus. We can only imagine all the amazing things they saw. I mean, you know, and it it really is incredible just to think about the things they saw, the conversations they had. And, you know, and and that brings up a few questions. Because, you know, when you see that, you know, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. What was he doing during that time? What, you know, what happened that they didn't write about? You know, wouldn't we all kind of like to know what some of those things were? And it does, it, it caused a few questions. You know, the first one was, what did they see? What, what happened? You know, and then it brings another question. So can we rely on some of the apocryphal books? 
I mean, because, you know, obviously, maybe it's true. I mean, John said there was a lot of other things Jesus did. So, you know, uh, maybe that story about Jesus was he was a little kid and he was playing with another kid and the kid died and, Jesus, you know, Jesus went and touched him and he came back to life. Is that story true? I forgot what apocryphal book that was from. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, there's all, and there, there's some weird stories. There's one story in there where it makes it sound like Jesus actually killed the kid. You know, he like cursed him because the kid did something mean to him and then I raised him from the dead. Oh, there's weird stories out there. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give those things a whole lot of credibility. But we do, we get curious. I'd like to know more of those stories. I'll just admit it. I'd like to know more of those stories. I'd like to know some of those things that they saw. And this is the other, and so the other question that comes is why were these things hidden from us? Okay. And that's what people always do with these apocryphal books. They all, you know, there's all, I've seen these documentaries, you know, banned from the Bible. Why didn't they want us to have those books? You know, they, meaning, you know, the church fathers, whoever, what was it that they didn't want us to know? Okay. And listen, I don't think it was that they didn't want us to know anything. It's just those books weren't inspired. Those books had flaws. Those books had mistakes. God gave us everything we needed. Okay, everything we need is contained in this book right here. We don't need Josephus. You know, we don't need you know all those apocryphal books. You know, we don't. I'm not worried one bit about that book of Judas that they found uh, recently that makes Judas out to actually be the hero. You know, that Judas's betrayal of Jesus was something that Jesus needed him to do, and so he was actually a hero. I, it's just it's ridiculous. Uh, some of these things, but listen, you know, it's not that these things were hidden. It's just God is giving us for now what a person needs. So they will believe on him and be saved. And this is what's in here is what we need. Just like it said in John 20, 30 and 31, you know, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. What was it that Paul said? Knowledge puffeth up, right? If we did, if we had all this extra knowledge, okay, of, you know, these other things that Jesus did that aren't in the Bible, we would get puffed up by that, okay? And listen, maybe I shouldn't confess this. I might make some people mad. I've read a lot of apocryphal books. I've read them for entertainment purposes only, okay? And I... One of my favorite things to do with preachers is when we're discussing different subjects of, of the Bible, especially stuff from Genesis. I will, you know, a lot of the questions that people have from Genesis has answers in apocryphal books. And a lot of times when these questions come up, I will give answers from these apocryphal books, but I don't tell them it's from an apocryphal book. And some of these answers, they make so much sense. And the look on these people's faces is hilarious when you start telling some of these stories. And because they're like, I know I didn't miss that story in the Bible. <laughs> and I know you're not smart enough to make that up, you know. And then, and then you'll mention, and then, and then they, go, they start freaking out, thinking I actually be like, no, I, I really don't believe it. And I, I know where a lot of that stuff comes from. And it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's not trustworthy at all. But it is a lot of fun to freak people out with that. And, you know, and at the same time, too, if those things were true, though, and there are, there's people out there that believe them and act like they're true. And you know what they are? They're all a bunch of know-it-all, puffed up, big shots that don't even believe all of the scriptures. You know, they trust these apocryphal books over the word of God. And listen, what God gave us, he did he. You know, he wasn't going to write a whole bunch of books to just give us all this knowledge that would puff us up. He was giving us what we would need so we would have faith in Christ, so we would believe on Christ, so we could be saved. Anything extra that we need to know about, we'll find out when we get to heaven. I believe when we get to heaven, we'll find out, we'll find out what Jesus did. You know, during those three years of ministry, we'll find out what happened when he was a kid. Did he ever kill a kid? I don't think so. You know, did he ever, did he ever raise a kid from the dead? You know, I don't think so. When he was on his way to Egypt, did Jesus, when they, his family got really thirsty, did Jesus make a spring appear out there that's still there to this day? I don't know. 
They say there's a spring somewhere out there that they say Jesus actually made that spring come. I don't even know what book that's from. But, uh, you know, does that, does, it, does that matter? Absolutely not. Does that have anything to do with salvation? Absolutely not. If it, if it happened, we'll find out when we get into heaven. What we just need to do is we need to believe on Him and get saved. And then one last verse I want to show you. Go to go to First John chapter one. First John chapter one. So the, obviously this is written by uh, John, who wrote the Gospel of John. We see that the whole point of writing the Gospel of John was so people would believe on Christ. And it says in John one one that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. John's writings from the gospel of John, first John, uh, first, second, third John, even revelation. These things were written because he's showing that, Hey, we are witnesses. We've seen it. We've seen the word of life. We've handled the word of life is what he calls them here. in first John chapter one, Jesus Christ is, is the source of life. He is eternal life. If you want to have eternal life, the only way you're going to get it is through Jesus Christ. And so these writings, these scriptures that God has given us are what we need so we can be saved. And so you know what? I'm not interested in trying to find out things that God did not show me in his word. Those things are not important. Until I get every bit of this down completely, I don't need to worry about anything else. This is what will get people saved. Nobody's going to get saved from the book of Jasher, or the book of Enoch, or you know, the book of Judas or anything. Nobody's going to get saved from those things. They're going to get saved from believing what's in the Word of God. And John's writings, they were, they were all about Jesus. And that's why I title all the chapters, you know, Jesus Christ. You know, he's this, he's that, you know, the bread of life, the water of life, the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ, the eternal life. In this case, this one, Jesus Christ, the word of life, life, com- eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. And those writings were there for a very specific purpose. So we will believe for whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is why we need to get the word of God to people. This is why we need to preach the word of God. This is why you know, we give away John and Romans. John's one of the best books that people can read to start out with. It's written specifically to get people to believe on Christ because that is what will save them. If you meet somebody that's, that's lost or, they, or you give them a Bible, most of the time we give away full Bibles. And I always tell them, first book I always tell them, hey, don't start in Genesis. You can read Genesis if you want. But you know what? I always tell them, start in the book of John. I'll usually mark it for them. Read the book of John. That way... They will believe it's, it's a great book. It's a great book for soul winners. And so anyway, with all that, that is, that's what the book of John is all about. So we will believe. And it's very clear. You won't see anything in the book of John showing works for salvation, baptism for salvation, a changed life for salvation. You don't even hear John really talking about repentance, do you? Repenting is in turning from your sins. You don't see that. But you see, believe over and over and over and over again because this is a book to get people saved. And the emphasis of this book is very, very clear. There's no doubt about it. You see it in every chapter. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust Him. That is how a person gets saved. And so with that, let's all stand together.